Hi everyone, my name is Jack, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The summer of 1985 in London turned out to be sunny and warm, breathing nature and tranquility. However, at 3.30 on the morning of August 7th, a sudden phone call rang at the home of Jeremy Bamber, heir to the White House farm. The young man, barely awake, picked up the phone, wondering who could be calling him so early. On the other end of the line was his foster father, his voice sounding unusual. He was clearly panicking, and Jeremy couldn't make out his father's words. He tried to concentrate and realize what had happened, but his son's efforts were futile, and soon there was an eerie silence on the other end of the line. The last thing Jeremy heard from his father was, Your sister's gone crazy. She's got a gun. An alarmed Jeremy, wasting no time, immediately called the police and reported the frightening conversation, emphasizing the possible danger from his sister. Officers arrived on the scene an hour and a half late after receiving the call. They were followed by Jeremy himself. There was a strange silence and stillness all around. This was suspicious after what the son of the farm owners had described to the police over the phone. Since it was suspected that weapons were involved, the English police decided not to rush inside, which was their professional tactic. The effectiveness of such actions can be discussed endlessly, but it is up to the English authorities. When they arrive at the scene of a call, they are usually unarmed and do not interfere in what is happening, waiting either for the situation to resolve itself or for a special unit to intervene. The police officers remained at a distance from the house and Jeremy was close to them. They asked him to tell them everything that had happened at the Bumbers house the night before. According to Jeremy, on the evening of the previous day, they had been sitting around the dinner table as a family. There was a slight misunderstanding at the end of dinner, but nothing serious that could have caused such a tragedy. He also added that he had left his weapons, a pistol and a .22 caliber carbine, with his parents. Both weapons were serviceable and loaded. A special team that arrived on the scene found that all doors and windows in the house were locked, except for the window in the master bedroom on the first floor. Using a loudspeaker, they spent two hours trying to communicate with someone in the house, but the only sound that came from the house was the barking of a dog. Nearly three hours had passed since the first police officers arrived on the scene. At eight o'clock in the morning, the SWAT team finally made their way inside the house, where an eerie silence reigned. The group moved carefully around the first floor, looking carefully through the rooms. As they approached the kitchen, they witnessed chaos. An overturned chair lay on the floor, and in a pool of blood lay the lifeless body of a man. It was Neville Bamber, Jeremy's father. Neville's body looked disfigured, bruises and abrasions on his arms and face, a broken nose and jaw as if he had fought fiercely. There was no way to help him. Eight bullet wounds, including six to the head, had completely eliminated his chances of survival. On one of the surfaces of the kitchen lay a telephone with its receiver removed, next to several rounds of .22 caliber ammunition. The picture shocked the police officers, but they had to move forward to investigate the entire house in detail. It was decided to scrutinize the first floor first, and then move to the second floor if there were no other family members present. Every step had to be controlled to avoid unnecessary noise, but this proved to be a difficult task given the creaky floor of the old house. There was no one else on the first floor, but on the second floor, in two bedrooms, four more bodies were found. June, Sheila, and two small boys, Daniel and Nicholas. They had all been killed by gunshots. June had been shot seven times, Daniel and Nicholas five and three shots each. Sheila was lying on the doorstep of her parents' bedroom with two bullet wounds under her chin and a gun in her hands. Twenty-five bullets had been used to kill five family members. That number of bullets raised questions. Was it possible that someone had deliberately decided to take out the bummers on purpose, and what was the motive? Could it be that the real culprit was trying to mislead the police? Answers to all of these questions were needed and authorities immediately began investigating and began researching the history of all members of the dead family. The history of the Bamber family. The county of Essex, with its nature, is in close proximity to the noisy and crowded London, 
where there is always an endless stream of tourists flowing. Nevertheless, it retains its value in the eyes of the locals, providing a haven from the bustling capital. The county invites you to relax body and soul, enjoy the fresh air, stroll through endless green meadows, taste crystal clear lake water, visit medieval castles and immerse yourself in fascinating stories. It was probably these benefits that made Essex an attractive destination for the Bamber family, who decided to settle here. June and Neville, with the acquisition of White House Farm, were able to make their dream come true. In 1949, at the age of 25, June married Neville and the couple set off to their farm, aiming to build a strong and prosperous family. Neville, a veteran of the Royal Air Force, having completed his years of service, took on the role of magistrate of the local court. However, fate presented the couple with several unforeseen twists and turns. June's long efforts to get pregnant proved futile, but they did not despair and decided to turn to an orphanage to take in their family two children. So, Sheila, at just three months old, and later Jeremy, at six months old, became part of their lives. June and Neville proved to be caring parents, filling their children's days with love and care. Growing up, their children received an excellent education from them at prestigious private schools. The Bummers' financial situation was extremely prosperous, allowing them to provide their children with every opportunity. Jeremy, despite the brilliant education, was characterized by a withdrawn character and preferred solitude from childhood. His tendency to rebelliousness was evident in elementary school, where he did poorly, which led to his parents' decision to send him to boarding school in 1970, when he was nine years old. The English boarding schools of the time were rigid, and Jeremy quickly realized that there would be strict discipline. The years at boarding school were difficult, but may have played a role in changing Jeremy's character for the better. Having excelled at university, he became more calm, and his parents were proud of their son. After successfully completing university, Jeremy's father, Neville, offered him a job on a farm in England. The young man immediately accepted the offer, and in 1982, he returned from the journey he had been on since completing his studies. His parents provided him with comfortable accommodations, including a cottage, a car, and a good salary. They also counted on him to help them in their old age. However, despite outward success within the family, Jeremy faced tensions related to religious differences. June, a deeply religious woman, experienced turbulent emotions because her children did not share her religious beliefs. Her attempts to guide them toward faith were futile. Difficulties in family relationships and frustration led her to depression. She underwent treatment that included the use of electroshock, which at the time was considered a method of dealing with mental illness. Sheila, June, and Neville's daughter also had a significant impact on her mother's development of depression. Unlike her calmer brother Jeremy, she was fascinated by the fashion world and dreamed of becoming a model. But June adamantly denied the idea, not wanting to hear about her daughter being involved in the world of show business. These were just a few of the many surprises Sheila gave her parents. At the age of 17, she announced she was pregnant, and June was faced with a difficult choice. Forbid her daughter to have a child out of wedlock, as it was religiously unacceptable, or force her to have an abortion, which is also forbidden in the Christian world. In the end, June relieved herself of all responsibility and asked Sheila to make the decision herself, but in such a way that no one in their family would ever know that she had gotten rid of the pregnancy. The result was a deterioration in the relationship between mother and adopted daughter. In 1977, Sheila did marry Colin Cuffell, the father of her first unborn child, despite her parents' protests. The young men became a family and soon had twins, Nicholas and Daniel. However, after some time, Sheila began to suspect her husband of infidelity and filed for divorce. This had a serious impact on her mental health. Sheila spent several months in a psychiatric hospital where she was also treated with electroshock therapy just like her mother. Meanwhile, Sheila's sons were sent to an orphanage where they stayed for almost two years. Sheila's health only worsened. She became anxious, often expressing a desire to take her and her children's lives, claiming that they were under the influence of the devil. She suffered from paranoid schizophrenia, while Jeremy, who used to cause a lot of problems for his parents, 
calmed down and was happy with his life on the farm. In 1985, Sheila met up with her ex-husband Colin again, and they reunited, taking their sons from the orphanage. In August, Sheila and her children were invited to the Bamber home to meet her parents. They were going to stay there for a week, after which Colin and the boys were to take a trip to Norway. He brought Sheila and the children to the farm, and on Tuesday, August 6, 1985, everyone gathered at the beautiful White House farmhouse. It turned out to be the last dinner of the Bamber family. A few days after the tragedy, the Bumber's funeral was held, and naturally Jeremy attended. It was a difficult and bitter moment for him. He cried a lot and was shocked by what had happened. But it was on this day that the investigation took a new turn. Strange behavior was noticed in Jeremy's behavior, which relatives of the Bamber family reported to the authorities. During breaks between bouts of grief and tears, he would utter ridiculous phrases, referring to himself as the boss. Those around him saw a smile on his face, and it was an unusual smile, but a smile characteristic of a contented winner. All these observations and remarks were passed on to the authorities, and they decided to investigate more thoroughly. On this ill-fated evening, everything seemed perfect. A family dinner, a joyous mood, a delicious meal. However, one comment made by Neville and June changed things. The parents suggested that Sheila send the children back to the orphanage, emphasizing that she was unable to provide them with a proper upbringing. This provocative suggestion displeased Sheila, and she reacted sharply, saying that she was already thinking about it and would make a decision on her own. The warm atmosphere of the evening was broken. At 9.30 p.m., Jeremy headed to his house. At the same time, Barbara Wilson, the secretary of the Bamber farm, called with a work-related matter. Neville picked up the phone and Barbara noticed that he was irritable. There were loud voices in the background. People seemed to be arguing excitedly. This atmosphere amazed Barbara, for such a thing was a rare occurrence for the bummers. She was unable to find out the cause of the conflict, however, as Neville quickly ended the conversation and hung up the phone. The next morning, all the family members in the house were found shot dead. Jeremy was the only one of the family left alive. He was unable to hide his tears. Investigators were respectful of his emotions and gave Jeremy time to recover before beginning interviews. Jeremy shared all the information available, not forgetting to mention the difficulties his sister had faced in life and the conflict over dinner on the evening of August 6th before he left the house. At first glance, the crime committed by Sheila appears to be a desperate and certainly unconscious act given her mental state. Under the influence of a parental remark, she could not stand the new invasion of her privacy, lost her mind, and resorted to gun violence, shooting the bummers, her children, and herself. Investigators were certain that's exactly what happened. During an examination of the house, it became clear that the crime, which destroyed almost the entire family, was committed by the Bamber's mentally unstable adopted daughter, Sheila. This was evidenced by the weapon found lying on her body, pointing upwards towards her chin. The actions of the detectives subsequently seem rather absurd. The police decided to put the house in order and to organize a strange process of burning the bloody bedding and carpets on which the bodies were lying. The police reasoned that they wished to rid Jeremy of the horrible memories of what had happened and the weapon found at the scene, which was potential evidence, was picked up by the officer with his bare hands. Reopening the investigation required a thorough examination of the scene to avoid jumping to conclusions. The first step was for detectives to examine the weapon. Several people's fingerprints were found on the barrel, including the investigator, who apparently picked up an important piece of evidence without using gloves. The presence of Sheila's and Jeremy's prints didn't raise any questions. Jeremy confirmed that it was his gun, designed for hunting. He had purchased it legally. Sheila's prints, being a suspect in this crime, were quite expected. However, it is worth noting that the alleged perpetrator was shot twice in different parts of her body. How did she manage to subsequently take her own life? And that's where things started to become clearer. Suddenly, Julie, Jeremy's girlfriend, began to express doubts about his innocence. She contacted investigators and provided them with some curious details. On the night of August 7th, Jeremy called her, reporting problems at the farm. However, when Julie tried to find out more, Jeremy abruptly hung up. In addition, 
She recalled that several times before the tragedy, Jeremy had complained to her about his family, expressing fatigue with his in-laws. But the most shocking aspect of her testimony concerned the Bummers' will. It turns out that the Bummers had made a will stating that all of their property was to go to their children upon their death, half to each. And also their mother was going to rewrite their share in favor of the twins' Sheila. This fact turned Jeremy against his sister. He did not like this prospect, and he openly shared it with his friend. Besides, Neville's will stated that Jeremy would have to work on the farm to get his share of the inheritance. But the worst part was when Julie heard him say how Jeremy dreamed of killing his family and putting the blame on the mentally unstable Sheila. He demonstrated some good acting skills by portraying himself as a witness to the tragic drama in front of the police officers. According to Julie, she told the police about it not only out of a desire to help in the investigation, but also out of a thirst for revenge, having learned about Jeremy's mistress. In an attempt to cover his tracks and draw the detective's attention away from himself, Jeremy gave the police the name of a potential suspect. He targeted a plumber he supposedly hired to work on the property. However, this cunning plan did not work. The plumber was found and interrogated, but his alibi was solid. The plumber not only did not understand why he was being questioned about the crime, but also provided clear evidence that he was elsewhere at the time of the events. Thus, the circle of suspects was narrowed down to one, Jeremy Bamber himself. Despite his temporary arrest, the lack of concrete evidence led to his release. Moreover, the police did not restrict his travel abroad, although it was known that after the inheritance, Jeremy's financial condition had improved markedly. Soon, he had already left England and traveled to Saint-Tropez, France, to enjoy a vacation. And a few days before, he easily got rid of his father's car by selling it. Jeremy's cousins demanded that the version that Sheila killed her family be reconsidered. They went to the police and the media, to which the deputy head of the CID once ordered the Bamber cousins to leave his office when they asked him to consider that James Bamber had arranged the whole thing. Afterward, one of the brothers decided to inspect the scene in secret from the others. His strong doubts about Sheila's involvement in the murder prompted him to look for more evidence. By then, Jeremy had gotten the keys to his parents' house and was living there all alone. His cousin managed to get through the door and around every corner of the house, hoping to find some new evidence. And his search was successful. In one of the closets, he found an item that gave him a shock a silencer for a .22 caliber carbine with traces of blood. It was something that spurred him to new conclusions. The length of the weapon, including the installed silencer, told him that the assailant would not have been able to turn it on himself and shoot himself. This meant that Sheila could not have been involved in the crime. Having been shot twice and bleeding, she would not have been able to remove the silencer and hide it deep in the closet. But assuming that she fired without this additional device, a new question arises. Why were there traces of blood on the end of the silencer? Thus, it only confirmed that it had been fitted to the carbine at the time of the crime. On September 29th, Jeremy returned home and was immediately arrested and charged with the murder of the Bamber family. The trial, which lasted 18 days, began on October 3, 1986 at Chelmsford Crown Court. Jeremy Bamber looked arrogant as he took his seat in the dock. Throughout the trial, Prosecutors accused him of lying. The station's telephone technicians checked and confirmed that the phone line at Bamber's home was busy that night. The medical examiner's testimony at trial was key. Injuries on Neville's body found by the experts included several bruises, indicating that the elderly man had resisted blows. The medical examiner suggested that Neville had been beaten with the very same point .22 caliber carbine. However, given Sheila's frailty and short stature, it is doubtful that she could have inflicted such serious injuries on her father before his death. It is more likely that Jeremy was capable of such an act. Neville's body was covered in bruises, and it is obvious that Sheila must have also taken a few blows during the fight. However, there were no signs of beatings or bruises on her body. Jeremy's lawyers insisted that Sheila, despite her mental problems, was physically fit and capable of crime. Her experience with guns and excellent shooting skills were arguments that she could have committed the crime. They also noticed that Sheila's blood was fresher than that of other family members. 
which, in their opinion, indicated the likelihood that she had first massacred her family and then herself. This may have been the result of a realization of her act or, as the defense lawyer suggested, a reaction to the approaching police officers. After hearing these theories, the prosecution unequivocally refuted them. The silencer was found in the closet with traces of blood belonging to Sheila, although, logically, it should have been on the carbine. These statements were irrefutable. The defense was in a difficult position and had no more arguments to counter the prosecution's case. According to the prosecution, the motive for the crime was Jeremy's anger at learning of the divided will. The money was the reason he had arranged the bloodbath. On the day of the incident, the housekeeper saw Sheila and did not notice anything unusual in her behavior. The day before, two employees had also seen her with the children and said she was happy and adequate. According to the testimony of Barbara Wilson, the farm clerk, she called Neville at about 9.30 p.m. and was under the impression that she had broken off an argument. Barbara said that Neville was not happy and seemed to hang up in annoyance, which he had never done before. In her opinion, he was a calm man. It was at this time, between half past 10 and 10 o'clock, that Jeremy left his in-laws and headed home. Late at night he returned on the bicycle he had borrowed from his mother a few days before the events, avoiding the main road so as not to be seen. Taking advantage of an open window in a first-floor room, Jeremy got inside and found a pre-prepared and loaded gun. When he entered his parents' bedroom, he fired two shots, killing Jane. Then he pointed the gun at Neville, but his father woke up and tried to defend himself. A struggle ensued, during which father and son went downstairs, and there Jeremy was able to kill his father in the kitchen. He then returned to the bedroom where he finished off Sheila and her children. To make it appear that his sister was guilty of the crime, Jeremy placed the carbine in the dead Sheila's hands. Afterward, he returned to his bike and headed home. He first called his friend Julie and almost gave himself away with excitement and then called the police, talking about his father allegedly calling. This call also raised questions for the investigation. If Neville was in danger, he probably would have gone to the police, not to his son. And the phone in the Bamber house was not covered in blood, even though the father, according to Jeremy's testimony, was probably injured at the time of the call. This suggested that the telephone receiver in the house had been removed for staging. Jeremy's own behavior also raised suspicions. Why, after his father called, did he not rush to the scene? After all, it was his family. Based on all the known facts and assumptions, the jury retired to deliberate on the verdict. Before doing so, the judge pointed out three main questions to the jury. They had to decide who should be believed, Julie Mugford or Jeremy Bamber. It was also important to find out if they were convinced that Sheila did not commit the crime. The judge emphasized that this issue was linked to another important question. Was the second fatal shot fired at Sheila fired with a silencer? If the answer is yes, that eliminated the possibility that she could have committed the shot. Finally, was a call from Neville Bamber to his son actually made in the middle of the night? The absence of such a call undermined Jason's entire version of events. On October 28th, after more than nine hours of deliberation, the jury unanimously found Jason Bamber guilty by a majority vote of 10 to 2, the minimum required for conviction. He was sentenced to five life sentences in prison without parole. Home Secretary Douglas Hurd ruled in 1988 that Bamber should not be released. The case remains a matter of controversy, despite there being no direct evidence that Jeremy Bamber is guilty. He is serving his sentence. There is a belief that there may have been a miscarriage of justice, and the true culprit is his sister Sheila. Bamber insists on his innocence by filing appeals. His lawyer argues that the judgment was biased because of Jeremy's aggressive behavior in court. Jeremy Bamber believes that there is no evidence of his guilt, and there are many unexplained points in the case. Tests on Sheila's hands were not conducted, there was police misconduct at the scene, and there remains speculation of retaliation by Jeremy's ex-girlfriend. A trial was held in 1991 at Bamber's request, but in 1996, a police officer destroyed much of the physical evidence. Jeremy's defense team called it a disgrace. In 1997, a DNA test was conducted that showed the presence of Sheila and June's blood in the silencer, 
but the results were complicated and ambiguous. In 2012, gun experts from the US and UK argued that the injuries on the bodies were not consistent with the use of a silencer. In 2015, Jeremy Bamber filed an appeal demanding that all evidence be turned over to the defense under the guise of a lawyer for which he was sentenced to an additional 14 years in prison for fraud. Seeking proof of his innocence, Bamber set up websites to discuss the case and offered a large reward for evidence that could overturn his conviction. The Bamber family's case continues to attract public attention and raise doubts about the correctness of the verdict. What do you think about it? Is Jeremy guilty? Thanks for watching, guys. That was Jack with you. Subscribe to the channel. There are many shocking stories ahead.